Thank you for joining us. There are 130 participants in this meeting. Um, a testament to uh, Thomas Heghammer's uh, uh, great uh, renown as one of the world's leading scholars of uh, jihadism. Uh, and we're here to discuss his new book, The Caravan, uh, Abdullah Razam and the Rise of Global Jihad, uh, which he has spent the past decade uh, working on and is probably one of the most important books that's been written uh, in, in and around this subject um, since 9-11. In fact, I would, I would say it certainly is one of those, the most important books written since 9-11 on this subject. So we'll, we'll turn it over to, to Thomas um, and he'll speak about some of the big ideas in the book and some of the key stories and then we'll have a discussion moderated by, by myself and we'll open it up to, um, to uh, questions which you can put in the chat. So over to you, Thomas. Thanks very much, Peter, for, those, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thanks to New America for, for organizing this. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry I couldn't be uh, in DC in person, um, but I'm thrilled that we could do this instead. And I want to thank everyone who's logged in from various places around the world to um, listen to um, us and, and, and take part in the, in the discussion. Um, I'm also, of course, thrilled to have the book out after so many years. I remember, Peter, I came to your office, I think in 2007 or 2008. Uh, you probably had no idea <laughs> who I was, this young guy walking in and asking for you know, help with this new project. And you were very generous and gave me a whole bunch of sources, contacts, et cetera, that served me well in the, in the beginning. Um, I don't think any of us, neither of us, thought it would take this long, but here we are. And uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have it out. In fact, I spent so long on this thing that um, a friend recently said uh, that he knew the book when it was little. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's been a while. He's about the same age as my, as my eldest son, he's 12 years old. Anyway, um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a long book and it's quite rich and there are lot, there are lots of different things I could, I could talk about. Um, there are a lot of new things in there because almost all of it is kind of based on primary sources and a lot of it is new. Um, but, we, but I figured I would focus on three main themes in the book. And the first is adventure. Um, because it's... You know, it's a biography of this, this person who lived from the early 40s to the late 80s uh, and who lived a very interesting life, uh, lived in many different countries, did many different things. And it, it's testimony to, you know, the fact that he lived in a completely different time as far as jihadi activism was concerned. Um, it was a different era. Uh, and if you were calling for jihad or doing jihad in Afghanistan or elsewhere, you didn't have to leave a clandestine life. Um, you could be, it may be so, so people like Azam, they were out and about in the world to an extent that later militants could not. So, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, Im imagine, if, you know, you, you want to write the biography of sort of the leader of, you know, IS or whatever the, the dominant jihadi organization is in say 15, 20 years, the bio is gonna be like, oh, he joined IS at age 17 and then he lived in a cave. Um, for Azam and, and in the beginning of you know, the lives of people like Bin Laden too, it was very different. They, they, they traveled, traveled around. And so we get these stories in the book of Azam you know, traveling to America, going to Spain, going to Italy, um, going to Germany, to the UK, giving speeches, um, and operating completely openly. Uh, and so you also get these sort of strange stories. Like one of the, I think, most perhaps most interesting findings in, in, or sort of tidbits in the book is that Abdullah Azam and Osama bin Laden met for the first time, not in Saudi Arabia, but in Indianapolis, Indiana in January, 1978, um, because 
in the late 70s, these Islamic cultural centers were popping up on campuses around the US. And what they typically did when they launched was to, to, have, to have an sort of an inauguration seminar and they would bring in uh, sort of big names from the Middle East and very often Muslim Brotherhood leaders. And Azam was a Muslim Brotherhood big shot already by the late 70s. So he was invited in along with Muhammad Qutb and a bunch of other figures to uh, speak at this Islamic teaching center at the, you know, at, at, in, in Indiana, Indiana. And we know from, and, th and this we know from the, from the student newspaper uh, at the time. And we also know from the bi biography of, autobiography of Bin Laden's wife, that uh, Bin Laden was in America at the time. And she writes that uh, he heard that Azam was gonna speak in Indianapolis. So he did a detour up to Indianapolis to hear him speak. And we don't have details about exactly kind of, you know, how they met, how much they spoke, et cetera, but we know that they were in the same place at the same time. So that's, and, and that's the first recorded encounter between them. Um, you get other stories like um, uh, Tamim Al-Adnani, who was Azam's deputy and right hand in the late eighties, you know, the, the executive director of the services bureau uh, he he goes to places like Nigeria and he goes to Venezuela. Um, in Venezuela, he goes to speak to the uh, Palestinian expat community about the Afghan jihad and all that. And he get booed, gets booed because everyone there is PLO and leftist and they don't like <laughs> the religious guys. Um, and then you also get these sort of other unexpected connections. Uh, for example, that Abdullah Azam was friends with Cat Stevens, the pop star. Um, and the story there is that Cat uh, uh, Stevens obviously had converted to Islam in the late 70s. And he had set up a charity called Muslim Aid, which had operations in different sort of areas of the world where you know, there were humanitarian crises. And in the mid 80s, he wanted to set up a branch in Pakistan to help Afghan refugees around Peshawar. And by that time, Azam was sort of a, he, he was a, he'd been there for, been in Peshawar for a few years and he, he knew everybody. So he was kind of a, a big shot in the NGO community in Peshawar. So when Cat Steven comes there to set up his op operation, he meets with Azam and they, well, we don't know there too, we don't have all that much detail on kind of exactly how, what they did together, but we know that uh, Azam did an interview with Kurt Stevens in Al Jihad magazine. We put him on the front page of the magazine. We also know, interestingly, that uh, the Services Bureau sold cassette tapes with Himmins, so called Anashid, recorded by Kurt Stevens. And we know this because there are ads in Al Jihad magazine, you know, saying, buy this, buy this cassette tape with, with Anashid by Kurt Stevens. So, you get all these kind of crazy stories um, because it was possible at the time, because people could get around and, and jihad was kind of not nearly as kind of, as sort of politically uh, kind of uh, toxic as, as it is, as it is, at least the type of jihad that Azam was involved in. And I say this not just because it sort of has an entertainment value, but also because it's, it's, uh, that it has it brings insights. So one of the reasons I one of the reasons I, I chose to write this as a, as a biography is that Azam was a Forrest Gump of Islamism. He he was present in all the places where history was being made at the time, and I'm talking here about the 60s, 70s, and and and, and 80s. So he's you know, he's, he's there in Palestine in the 48 war between, uh, with, with Israel. He's there in 1967. He's, he's there during Black September of 1971. Um, he, he's, and he's there, of course, in uh, Afghanistan late, later on. So, and he also meets with a whole bunch of people who are senior figures in the Islamist movement. He meets pretty much Every 
you know, famous person in the Muslim Brotherhood um, in the in this period. So uh, he's a very useful prism for viewing the history of this period and putting uh, you know these stories together in a life like that, in a life account like that. It, it allows us to see how kind of different historical events are connected, how. You know the events of '48. You know re they reverberate many years later, and and uh, that, for example, there are people, Muslim brothers who fought in the War of '48, who pop up again in nine in the among the Fedayeen in '69, and they pop up, and the same person pops up again in the 1980s as a trainer in Afghanistan, um, and it helps us see that things that are isolated, you know, historically, so things that would be in different history books, as it were. Um, actually impact one another. Um, uh, and, 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 um, and so that's the sort of, that's the kind of adventure part of the, 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 the book. And the second theme is kind of related and it's exclusion or kind of exclusion and, and rootlessness. Um, because that's basically what Azam's life was like. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it helps explain his sort of transnational outlook, his kind of pan-Islamic view, his his distrust of nation states, and his his, his he, wa he basically was the sort of citizen of the Islamic world more than a citizen of any one Middle Eastern country. And to understand that, you have to look at the the, the, the sort of the the vagabond life that he that he led. So, um, you know, many will be familiar with sort of the broad outlines of his life, but let me just recap that quickly. He was born in Palestine in, in 1941. Um, and then in 1967, uh, because of the Six Day War, where Israel annexed the West Bank, where, where, including his, his village, he decided to flee he walked on foot from the Jenin area uh, to Amman. Uh, be, uh, and then he was never to return. And from this point onwards, he was a refugee, basically. And um, li he was living at the mercy of the regimes that hosted him. And, uh, you know, that would work fine for periods, but in other times, not so, so well. So, for example, um, in... Uh, uh, in 1970-71, sorry, in 1970, you know, Azam is involved with the Fedayeen in the beginning of the year, and then comes the, um, the so-called Black September, where the Jordanian government cracked down on, on the Fedayeen, um, and uh, Azam, uh, Probably partly because of the you know what what he's been involved in, he 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 moved he leaves Jordan. He goes to Cairo uh, to study for a PhD in Islamic law. He then comes back to Jordan, spends the seventies there teaching. But in the late seventies, he 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 becomes he gets into trouble with the regime big time. Um, they see him as an agitator, as someone who has you know a bad political influence on the youth. And they basically get it, they have him fired from the university and they essentially, you know, they encourage him to leave the country. So he's basically thrown out of Jordan for political reasons in 1980. So kind of he's uprooted once again. And, and then he spends this year in Saudi Arabia where he doesn't, he doesn't like it there. If his family doesn't feel that he's not happy there and he starts looking for somewhere else to go and, and he ends up in Afghanistan. But even in Afghanistan, he's kind of, he has to, you know, dodge um, um, uh, governments. In 1986, for example, the Pakistani government tried to crack down on the Services Bureau and the Afghan Arab community. And it gets so bad that Azam has to leave for shower and go into hiding um, in the border areas. Um, and then a few months later, they get you know, the, the Arabs and the Pakistani government come to some kind of agreement and he can return and things fine again but just to say that you know azam you know azam's life is this kind of uh uh kind of uh, conflict with regimes and he's, he's kind of living at their mercy and he's thrown out different from time to time and he, he never finds a place 
a country that it can call its own in, in, or a kind of a political uh, kind of uh, context where he can invest himself. And so in that sense, he's a, he's a kind of a microcosm or kind of or a mini example of a broader phenomenon, which is kind of the, perhaps the main argument of the book. Um, and, the, and the kind of the answer to the question, why jihadism goes global in the 1980s. And my argument in the book is that uh, jihadism goes global because of local repression. Um, because Azam was not the only person who kind of had to leave his country for political reasons and, and so on. Uh, from the 50s onwards, there, is a, there are kind of waves of people, especially Muslim brothers who are getting into trouble with, with their regimes and who are kind of forced into exile. Uh, many of them uh, end up in Saudi Arabia and many of them they gather in this area in the western part of Saudi Arabia where they get jobs in universities and in these international Islamic organizations. And basically what happens there, you get this sort of, what, what you get is uh, kind of a, a community of um, activists who, have, who are kind of excluded from their respective national contexts. So these Muslim brothers from Egypt and Syria and elsewhere, they're in Western Saudi Arabia and they have no, nowhere to kind of exercise politics because they, they, they can't participate in politics at home and they're not allowed to participate in politics in Saudi Arabia. But there's one domain which is open to them and that is the in international arena. Uh, and many of them then get involved in these international Islamic organizations that are kind of setting up you know, cultural centers and NGOs, etc., around the world. And what emerges then is what I call in the book and have called in previous, in previous work, the, the, the pan-Islamists. You know, this community of people who kind of, um, uh, who kind of emphasize this idea that all Muslims are one people and that this people is under threat from the outside and they, 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 they need to stand together more. Uh, you know, do more solidarity work to resist this outside threat. So it's to say that in the late 70s, you already have this pretty powerful community of people. I say powerful because they're in these organizations that, that get quite a lot of money. Uh, uh, p these, these people who are, you know, they're advocating this kind of pan-Islamic view of things. And it's a, it's a very sort of it's a, it's a, it's a, the, the victim narrative is central there. They, they, they see conspiracies against Islam everywhere and they kind of, they produce magazines that show the suffering of Muslims uh, everywhere. So, and, and, and this community I think is a product basically of kind of political repression in the region throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s. That, that, that these, Arab, these, many of these Arab regimes, they never found a way to, in, to, to integrate political Islam or, 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 or Islamists in the political system. And then some of those activists realized that, you know, if they just did international work, the regimes would more or less leave them alone. So, so, so this pan-Islamism is already there before the Afghanistan war. Um, and frankly, I think, you know, even, even if the Afghanistan war hadn't happened, we probably would have seen some kind of foreign fighter phenomenon in the 80s in another place. Um, and that's because <clears throat> this victim narrative, it was quite easy to militarize. Uh, and that's what Azam did. Azam militarized the sort of pan-Islamist victim narrative. Because the, the, most of the kind of the, the pan-Islamists in the 1970s, they were not really militants. They were not calling for jihad or stuff like that. They were, their modus operandi was kind of humanitarian aid and that kind of thing. But Azam came along, you know, after a few years in Afghanistan saying, look, you know, sending NGOs and stuff, that's fine, but it's just not enough. We need military solidarity. People need to come here and fight. And that's the, kind of, that's the, for, the root of the foreign fighter doctrine for which Azam is, is famous. Uh, so, um, so that's how kind of, you know, exclusion is, 
sort of a theme in Islam's life, but is also a kind of a, a cause for the globalization of jihadism. So let let me move then to the to the third and 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 the third theme, which is kind of the, the Pandora's box theme. Um, uh, and I, I call it the Pandora's box because it's sort of the story of how Azam lost control of the movement that he built. As we all know that Azam um, was a, a central figure in the mobilization of Afghan Arabs, and he did that in a very number of ways, setting up the Services Bureau, Bureau writing books, producing Al Jihad magazine, traveling around the world, preaching. Uh, so he was a classic sort of, you know, social movement entrepreneur. Um, but he, in, uh, in, in order to make this happen, he, he articulated a message, which was uh, every, you know, when, when a Muslim territory is under attack or occupation, all the world's Muslims have to go there and fight. And uh, this is a, an individual obligation. So, you sh so, so people shouldn't listen to their parents. They shouldn't listen to their local imams or to their governments. They shouldn't listen to any kinds of, of objections. They should just, you know, realize that this is an individual duty. In any objections they hear, they should just ignore and head to Afghanistan. Now, this was, of course, effective in the short term for getting people to Afghanistan. But the problem is that when you tell people not to listen to anyone, it's really just a matter of time before they stop listening to you. And what do you do then? Uh, and that's uh, what happened with the Afghan Arabs. So that uh, Azam kind of uh, sowed the seed of this big authority problem inside the movement. Uh, and he, and he, I mean, he got to experience the, 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 the initial effects of that authority problem in his lifetime. Uh, because as you know, and as you know, Peter, um, the Af African Arab community, you know, started to fragment pretty quickly in the, in the late uh, 80s. And you, at the end of it, you, you know, it's just this kind of um, hodgepodge of, you know, various groups and factions, many of whom don't like each other and they do different things, etc. Um, and of course, this is where Al Qaeda comes from. Um, and let me spend a minute or two on that because in my book, I offer a sort of an, a revised history of the birth of Al Qaeda, um, where it's, in my view, what happened was basically that um, um, th there was a, a kind of a, a clash of kind of interest or desires in the Afghan Arab community. You had those uh, like Azam, who were pragmatists, who kind of, who, who wanted the whole war to kind of go well and had a strategic view of things and, and, and who, who, who saw fighting, war fighting as just one component out of several necessary to win a war. That was kind of Azam's approach. Um, and as a result, the Services Bureau, especially in the beginning, was not mainly a training organization. They did lots of other things, humanitarian work, etc., cetera, um, because you had this holistic view of things. But, but, then, you, yeah, but then you had a bunch, of, a bunch of other people, perhaps most people, because they were, they were young, and they'd come for the adventure. What they wanted was something else. They wanted action. They wanted you know, the thrill. They wanted to go out in the field and fire rounds as soon as possible. They, want, they wanted to see, they wanted to, they wanted to kind of live out their they kind of they wanted to be sort of you know, Rambo's for a while, um, and they came to Peshawar and they found that the Services Bureau did not offer that. They could, you know, they, the Services Bureau might put them to work in an orphanage or, or you know, <laughs> or sweeping the corridors of one of the guest houses or something. And the few training camps that the Services Bureau had were, you know, were very, you know, basic. So um, you had this. You then got this sort of conflict between what I call the pragmatists and the militarists. And bin Laden was among the militarists. And so by mid-1986, bin Laden and a few other people, they're fed up. They, they're fed up with the Services Bureau, they've given up all hope that he can kind of 
save the military honor of Arabs there. So Azam sets up this, this you know, this camp uh, called Al Ma'sada uh, in Jaji, just inside the Afghan border. Um, uh, and it's become it becomes sort of semi-independent from the from the services bureau. And the thing is, when you to to run a camp on a kind of a full year basis, you need a kind of a bureaucracy. You need a, you need a guy to or so you need some some people to take care of procuring water. Others to you know to get hold of ammunition. Others to you know empty the latrines. Some people to run the training camps. I mean, so. You need a, a you know some type of type of organization to get a camp running, and my argument is that Al Qaeda emerged out of this proto bureaucracy that was necessary to run the Al Maqsada camp, and we and and I think the argument is strengthened by the fact that we find in Al Qaeda, you know, a year or two later, many of the people who were trainers and leaders of the Al Maqsada camp. So <clears throat> the point here is that Al Qaeda was a symptom of this authority problem that was already manifesting itself in the Afghan Arab community. And this authority problem was of Azam's own making. Now, of course, <clears throat> this authority problem becomes much worse after uh, Azam, after Azam is killed in 1989, because he's kind of, he's the last person with sufficient authority to sort of tame the Afghan Arabs. And so after he disappears, we see the, the jihadi movement fragmenting even more, and we see some of the groups descending further and further into, into violent excess uh, with you know, the you know, beheadings uh, en masse in Bosnia, the massacres in Algeria, not the 9-11 attacks, and of course now uh, Islamic State. And, I, and fundamentally, you know, very simply, simply put, all of this, I think, excess, it's, it's a product of this authority problem, this Pandora's box that Azam opened. Um, and I, I don't think Azam kind of realized the consequences of, of this. And I, I, I certainly don't think that he would have wanted to see this type of violence in his time. He, he wanted a more conventional type of fighting in Afghanistan. Um, but then, you know, others just stopped listening to him and went their own, their own way. Before I conclude, I, I need to, I guess, to see some, say something about Azam's death because it's sort of the, the biggest murder mystery in the history of, of jihadism. And uh, as, as many listeners will, will know, um, it was a you know it was a pretty sort of spectacular incident. Uh, it was, it, this happened on Friday, twenty fourth of November, nineteen eighty nine, uh, right outside the so-called Arab mosque in Peshawar, where most of the African Arabs went to pray. And this, when Azam was coming to deliver his weekly fr Friday prayer, so you had lots of people assembled in front of the mosque, you know, waiting for him. And just as he kind of pulls uh, uh, off the, the main road, to get close to the mosque, a bomb which is hidden under this sort of small bridge explodes and, and you know, uh, rips through the car and kills him. and his two sons were with, with, with him. Now, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry to say that I, you know, even after 10 years and 700 pages, I, I can't answer the question of who killed him. Um, but uh, I, I have some thoughts and I have some suspects. And um, the, thought, the thoughts are, first of all, that uh, um, whoever did this must, must have wanted to send a signal because you could, liquidate Azam quietly in so many other ways, you know, drive-by shooting, you know, by someone on a, on a, on a motorcycle at night, uh, you know. Azam's kind of whereabouts were fairly well known in the community and, you know, not be a problem to just take him out, you know, somewhere, you know, where nobody would look. But here it happened, you know, on a Friday at uh, noon, lots of people watching near a mosque, etc. You know, clearly someone wanted to send a message. Secondly, I think there, you know, there probably was a, a government hand involved because it's quite a complicated operation when you think about it. Um, uh, the, the, to get a bomb to go off under a moving car un, or an, under a specific moving car uh, is not, tra not straightforward. I mean, it's, uh, because uh, nobody knew exactly when Azam was going to come and you couldn't put a pressure plate bomb there because, you know, other cars were going to drive under there before him, etc. So you, 
you needed to have you know eyes on the target so there, there must have been a team of people involved you know and someone with eyes on the target uh and you know and someone with a hand a finger on the trigger um and this would have been have to be have been installed you know the night before a few days before without you know police noticing um this team would have been would have, would have had to be able to you know be present at you know the site without attracting attention and to extract you know from the area i mean you know, potentially from the country without getting noticed and i mean this requires quite a bit of opsec as we could say you know operational security and 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 uh, uh, and um, you know for like a non-state actor to do this it would have been complicated and very risky you know if you get caught you know it's you know, the, the reputational damage would have been ter terrible and you know if you got caught for something like this, you know, you would be you'd be, you'd be facing torture, you know, uh, and 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 worse in, in Pakistani prison. So, um, I'm my main suspects are basically government agencies, primarily uh, ISI, the Pakistani ISI itself, because it was operating on home turf. So the OPSEC problem was not big for them. Um, it had plenty of experience with this type of operation from years of doing similar things in Kabul and other places in, in Afghanistan. And it had reasons to uh, dislike Azam. As I mentioned before, they, they had been after the, the Arabs since 86 and they didn't like having the Arabs there. They were a source of kind of, um, you know, the, uh, of um, uh, kind of, uh, they couldn't be, really be controlled. Um, and also Azam was involved uh, around this time in diplomacy, in bringing uh, uh, Hekmatyar and Masood, two of the biggest Afghan warlords, kind of closer together, which was not in the ISI's interest. They want, they want, because that would make the Afghans themselves kind of stronger and less dependent on, on Pakistan. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, to me, ISI looks like the prime suspect, but I have no hard evidence to uh, to, to prove it. So we have to wait for, you know, some key documents to be classified or like a, a vital source to kind of come out and, you know, tell, tell the truth uh, before, we, before we can know more about this. But anyway, I've spoken for too long and, and um, we need to get into the Q&A part, which is uh, the most important. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I mean, picking up on that final question about Azam's death, I mean, uh, in any event, you're looking at two questions, uh, capability and motivation. Yeah. And I think you're emphasizing capability. Um, I think there was another group which had even higher motivations, which is essentially the groups of the group of Egyptians uh, that really hated Azam. Uh, now, they, they didn't necessarily have the capabilities, but there were quite a number of them who'd served in the Egyptian military uh, who were living in Peshawar, and, and I've always thought, I mean, I think your ISI uh, uh, theory is, is certainly um, quite reasonable, but I've always thought the level of hatred for Azam amongst these Egyptian Islamists who were in Peshawar was sort of off the charts, and um, they certainly wanted him dead. Now, did they do it? Who knows? But I just wanted to, to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, Azam uh, had uh, you know, enemies, um, in 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 the Afghan Arab community, and there's notably this um, this conflict, um, this dispute rather that happened a year before his his his, his death, um, over basic over money uh, with a guy called Ahmed Khadr, uh, who was uh, he was basically um, an Egyptian Canadian. Um, and, and that it's a kind of an infamous, infamous family because some of his children later became you know involved in Al Qaeda and some of them ended up on Guantanamo etc. But anyway, this is their, their father and 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 uh, he was he he had a uh, an NGO um, in Afghanistan and he, he entered into this kind of cooperation with the Services Bureau, um, but that relationship went sour for reasons that are too complicated to get into here, but, but it's basically, they disagreed about money and about how kind of, you know, they, Azam and, uh, and Walid, uh, and Walid Julidan, they accused 
uh, Khadr of kind of you know stealing money, etc. And the whole thing escalated into this kind of dis- dispute, and there was this adjudication, which is sometimes referred to as kind of the trial of Azam in the literature. But it was not so much a trial of Azam uh, as a as a kind of just a, an adjudication uh, of a you know a legal dispute over money and and. Um, um, and I, this is to say that you know there was you know there were tensions, but I think I think perhaps that in some of the existing literature the the enmity between Azam and the Egyptians has been uh, perhaps uh, exaggerated a little bit, and that um, uh, there may have there may have been in, you know a few individuals who really hated the gods of, of Azam, but there were but but Azam also had many Egyptians who who, who liked him, and he, Azam for example was close friends with uh, the blind Sheikh Omar, Omar Abd al-Rahman. Now, of course, he's from the Al-Gamal Islamiya and not Al-Jihad, you know, the Al-Jihad of, of Zawahiri and so on. But it's to say that, that um, to the extent that there, you know, there was visceral hatred of Azam, it was probably in a, in a small clique in the Al-Jihad community. And, um, and it's certainly possible that, that they, they may have done this. Um, uh, because, as you say, they had they had expertise, and and we know from you know things like the Encyclopedia of Jihad, which was you know from around this time that they were practicing or thinking about you know techniques like you know, uh, you know um, uh, techniques of urban warfare and 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 the like. And just picking up on that, and then I'll turn to the questions from which we have quite a few. Um, yeah, I mean the the founding of Al Qaeda does seem to be largely about a split between Azam and people that he used to be friendly with or close to even. Um, and that does seem to be relevant to the question of who killed him potentially. Right, well, um, yeah, um, it's just, the problem is like, um, is, is that when you kind of look at the, the contemporary sources, um, and, the, and I, what I found doing this book was that was a quite quite a big gap between the narratives that you know come out in the years right after 9/11, when when people like Abdullah Anas and many others you know speak out or they're kind of they're kind of journalists uh, you know chase them down and get them to talk about the other. But then and some of them write books etc. But most of this comes after 9/11. So the kind of the narrative of what happened then is. You know, the, m- very often this, this, you, know, you look at the traces to the source, and there's some statement that comes after 9/11. When you do, look at the, the the contemporary sources uh, from uh, the late 80s, there's a slightly different picture, and and uh, where it's ha- much harder to find uh, you know uh, clear evidence that that, that Osama bin Laden were were really not friendly or or even something basic like the Wahiri uh, being a prominent figure at all. I mean, Azam, Zawahiri is almost absent from the contemporary sources in the late 80s. No, I mean, I, had I, I... Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I'm just, and I, and I think Bin Laden and Azam, it seems unlikely to me that Bin Laden would have been involved in attacking a man who was really his mentor in many ways. But it yeah. seems people sort of in Zawahiri's circle uh, and the people that were kind of pulling uh, Bin Laden away uh, from Azam, um, yeah. To me, they seem to have some motivation, potentially. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, and and uh, well, here, um, let me ask you another, another follow-up question. Then, yeah. Which is, and um, what do you? So, I mean, the the materials that were rented in the Benevolence International Foundation trial, which the which for those on the call who may not know about them, are the, what appear to be minutes of a meeting that, that discusses the founding or perhaps uh, um, uh, of Al-Qaeda, or if not the founding of Al-Qaeda, sort of in some way memorializes the fact that Al-Qaeda has recently been created. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do you, how do you, I mean, uh, how do you treat those in, in the book? I, I, I read that section pretty carefully. Um, I, I, as I recall it, you seem to sort of suggest that Al Qaeda may have been founded a little bit earlier than these actual meetings, and this 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 might have been a sort of later recording of something that already happened. But leaving aside the question of timing, how do you assess those notes? Right. Um, yeah. So uh, 
as you say, I, I kind of revisit those notes um, and um, don't, and I don't see them as the the, the founding minutes of uh, an organization like Al Qaeda. They they don't they're not fr the, the the content just it's not what the founding minutes of an organization would look like. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, they you know they, the the content also makes it quite clear to me that you know that this is an organization that's already. Uh, in existence, so I, I I think it was found, you know, it kind of crystallized probably in the winter of 87, 88. But that's, I guess, a detail. Um, what, what I see those documents as is basically uh, as kind of talks, records of talks between this existing Al Qaeda and the Services Bureau, the people in the Services Bureau. And there's a, one of the documents refers to a sheikh, who's kind of kind of the main interlocutor. Um, to the Al Qaeda people, um, and in some existing literature, that sheikh has been assumed to be Azam. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why people, some people, have kind of implicated Azam in the founding of Al Qaeda, which is not the case. Azam was there's no evidence I think that Azam was was involved because I think that sheikh was not the Azam himself. He was probably Sheikh um, Tamim Al Adnani, his right hand. Uh, that I mentioned earlier, who went to Venezuela and got booed, um, and uh, and but even he, when you look read the document carefully, he, he he's not part of the same process. It's a kind of it's it's a negotiation almost. It's a uh, they're kind of coordinate, trying to coordinate training efforts and, and, and so on. So to me, uh, it shows you know both that we're dealing we're dealing we're, we're, we're dealing with two separate entities there already, but also that you know. That these entities are capable, perfectly capable of sitting down and talking business, mm. and um, and this is one of several indications I've, I found that that actually you know that Bin Laden and the men around him were on perfectly good working relations with the Services Bureau almost you know, till till the, till the end, um, and that you know there as part of the same document collection there you have there's a bunch of organigrams. Uh, that I don't, think anyone, I don't think anyone has written about before, but the, basically on organ, organigrams that have, um, they're, they're neither Al Qaeda clearly, and they're neither the Services Bureau, but it's some kind of mix. And so, so clearly at some point there, there was a an attempt to kind of you know create a super a sort of um, an organization that would kind of bring everyone together because you have names, you know, they, they have Bin Laden and Azam and some of the people from Al Qaeda and some of the people from the Services Bureau in on the same organigram. Um, so, and I think, you know, so I think th th these communities were quite, uh, especially the Bin Laden circle and, and the Azam circle were more closely interwoven than we have thought. Also, on this theme, uh, uh, it's often said that Bin Laden kind of set up his camp completely, you know, in you know, uh, clandestinely, you know, without telling Azam. But that's not the case at all. I mean, we have sources that put, you know that say that Azam was present on the day that Bin Laden discovered the site, and then, and Azam was one of the first people to come to Al Masada and, and inspect. And when when some people from from other Afghan Arabs said, you know, this, this is too dangerous, you should close it down. Azam said, no, maybe let him have it, you know. So Azam was, so this is also to say that Azam was quite well aware of what Azam, what, what Bin Laden was doing. He, he, he may not have been aware of kind of the name Al-Qaeda, that this was intended as, you know, like it was what it really was, but he was aware that Bin Laden was, you know, doing this training stuff, that he had this kind of separate roster of members, etc. cetera. Um, but he kind of, he let it, he let it pass. Great, so from Colin Clark, uh, thank you for this amazing work of scholarship. Thoroughly enjoyed it, put it in the category with Looming Tower and Ghost Wars. What books inspired you most during this process? Oh, first of all, thank, thanks very much. That's a, that's a huge compliment. Um, what books inspired me the most? That's a good question. Um, I think both of the books that he mentioned, uh, the Looming Tower and, uh, and uh, Ghost Wars, uh, uh, and of course, also the you know the the um, uh, yeah those, those books were useful because they're quite different books. So, so Larry Wright's book is is fantastic from from a, from a, kind of a narrative kind of you know so it's an exemplar of how to kind of dramatize 
non-fiction and, and Steve Coles is, is you know has this uh, incredible way of sort of, sort of synthesizing enormous amounts of information into his narrative uh, there are also but there are other books that, of which I've made incredible I mean they were extremely useful I uh, I mean, your books, Peter, especially the, the Osama bin Laden I know was a treasure trove for this. And actually, I remember many years ago when I reviewed the, that book, I, I said, you know, this is going to be so useful for people coming, you know, a few years down the line. And that's exactly what it, what it, what it was for, for this project. Um, um, but I, I um, at the same time, I, I wanted to wanted this to be a little bit different, uh, so that's why I, 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 I structured it as a as a biography, um, and uh, and I th I think I was you know inspired by several different types of biographies. Some you know from the field, people like, you know books like Bryn Elias, Architect of Global Jihad, of Omar Basuri, but also other you know, biographies completely unrelated to. Jihad. And I looked at the whole bunch of existing biographies. Um, so um, that's kind of the, one of the luxuries. And when you're an academic, you you know, especially at the early part of your career, you have to sort of there's a format you have to follow. There has to be there has to be a theory chapter and then a you know a test and then you know, like a conclusion with implications, etc. But as I'm you know already have tenure, I can be more free. I can choose kind of I can I can. I don't have to work always within that strict sort of academic way of structuring things. So I, I, that's so that's one of the reasons the book is structured the way it is. It wouldn't work. It probably wouldn't pass as a PhD uh, <laughs> thesis structure. <laughs> There's a wonderful irony there. Um, yeah. Thomas, do you know if Azam met uh, Saeed Qutub when he was studying in Cairo, and was Azam inspired in any way by Qutub's writing? Yeah, um, Az Azam was very much inspired by Said Qutb. Az Said Qutb was Azam's hero, and um, uh, but they never met because uh, Said Qutb was executed in 1966 when uh, when um, Azam was living in Palestine, mm. uh, and he Azam never never visited Cairo before then. Um, the first Azam probably first visited Cairo in '67 or '68, um, but uh, he he he, um, he never got to meet uh, Said Qutb himself. However, um, he uh, when he moved to Cairo in 1971, you know, one of the first things he did was to seek out the family of Said Qutb. So you know. It was kind of, I think, a pilgrimage for him. To kind of, and it, I think he wanted to get as close as possible as he could to Syed Qutb, um, you know, but without, uh, you know, a, a bar Syed Qutb himself. So what, who was that? They were his brother um, and his family, uh, his sister, for example, Amina Qutb. Um, and, uh, and so... Uh, and also later on in 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 Jordan, when he there in the seventies, you know, some people nicknamed Azam the kind of the Syed Qutb of Jordan, and I think he was very pleased with that, uh, mm -hmm. because that because because Qutb was his hero. And you we see, you know, especially in the in pre Afghanistan writings of Azam, we see Qutb all over the place, uh, citations, and especially in his student works, like his BA thesis and his. Uh, in his PhD, th uh, less in the PhD thesis, but especially in the BA thesis from like, 66, you know, it's, it, it describes the side Qutb as this sort of intellectual giant and everything. So uh, Qutb was very important. So, um, and I want to say here that, um, you know, in kind of, in the sort of, in the academic study of political Islam, we, we tend to categorize, put things in boxes. So. Uh, Qutb is often kind of put in the revolutionary box as someone who was focused on the internal enemy of kind of toppling the Muslim re regimes. As Azam often gets put into this, into this international box, someone who's you know you know building an international community of Afghan Arabs to wage the kind of you know geopolitics. Um, but but in reality, things can be more mixed up, and in in Azam they are, and and uh, so. So Azam, for all the stuff, all the things he says about kind of pan-Islamism and you know international politics, 
he's very very hostile to Muslim governments, uh, and he doesn't hesitate to pronounce takfir on on groups of people. There's this misperception in some of the literature that Azam was very you know very kind of tolerant and was not a takfir at all. No, he's on the record as saying you know that all nationalists are non-Muslims, um, all communists are kufar. Uh, this is referring to you know Gaddafi and other state leaders as 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 as, as Kufar. So he he ha- he had this sort of takfiri uh, instinct that some of the you know the sort of kutubists uh, tend to have. So a, a number of people asked a version of this question, which is essentially you argue in the book that jihadism went global in the eighties because of domestic repression by Arab regimes. Uh, if they adopted other policies, um, you know, might there have been other outcomes or would it have put Islamists in positions of power from which they would have continued to pursue their agendas? Ooh, yeah. Um, that question is too big for, uh, for, <laughs> I think for this webinar, but okay, um, it's, uh, it's, I, it's the central dilemma, I guess, in uh, perhaps, you know, it's in, in the, in, uh, in the in the modern history of you know political Islam, perhaps in the modern history of the Middle East, you know what could 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 uh, could Islamism have been handled better? Uh, could it have been integrated more without compromising, you know, uh, principles, you know, uh, human rights and so on? Um, I think yes. I mean, I. I um, it's, I mean, uh, and, I, and I say this not naively, because I think sometimes we forget how radical some of these groups were. And, and especially, so in, when we, especially when we get to the 60s, uh, you know, the, 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 the militant end of the, you know, the, these brotherhood, the, the brotherhood, especially in Syria and in Egypt, you know, they were really, uh, they, they were, you know, they were ready to c- carry out a coup and they, and they, uh, were hell bent on kind of having is- Islamic law implemented without any um, compromises. So, um, you know, in some sense, you can kind of understand the dilemma of the regimes at the time. Like, you know, you, 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 you mean, it wasn't easy to, always easy to integrate uh, these, some of these, these types, but I, I still think that the, you know, especially these, these um, Arab republics used, you know, excessively heavy repression f- to deal with a phenomenon that, that probably could have been uh, dealt with um, better with, without necessarily giving, you know, putting them in positions of power immediately, at least not with the, the most militant elements. Um, you know, there, there, there were more pro- progressive or kind of... Um, um, you know, compromise-ready elements of the Brotherhood in many of these countries, but they, but, but typically, what the regime did was to treat the whole organization, you know, uh, with one template. Um, so, I, guess I would be a tentative yes. Although I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I do realize that, you know, that, that some of these groups at the time were, you know, they were quite difficult to to deal with, and they, and they were less progressive, less kind of, it was nothing like, you know, the, 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 the Nahda party in Tunisia today. So it's mm. not like, you know, was, you can't say, oh, because look, it's fine. Look at Tunisia, the Nahda party is doing great. They're Democrats, liberal, et cetera. Uh, so why couldn't uh, you've done the same in Egypt in 1965? Uh, well, it's just because, you know, brotherhood, at least part of the brotherhood was nothing like the Nahda at the time. So I'm sensitive to those dilemmas, but I, 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 I still think there must have been other strategies um, available. Question from Matt Levitt. Uh, what happened to the Services Bureau um, after Azam died, was killed? Right. Um, it basically falls apart uh, uh, in the kind of substance, but the shell kind of exists. So, um, you know, almost immediately you get this sort of internal struggle for leadership uh, and resources and um, it's a little bit you know unclear exactly what happens because typically you know when 
you know, messy disputes like that, you know, people want to keep things under, you know, covered up because they want to keep a semblance of unity. But, uh, but with, I think we know that, you know, there were two kind of big factions inside the, uh, the, the Bureau, kind of the, the family faction and the, this, this other faction. Uh, and you know, a, few, a year or two in, they've they found some kind of modus vivendi, um, whether the, they could, uh, you know, they were just responsible for different parts of the business, um, but the bureau kind of continued to exist. And then it, it, um, uh, it continued, I think, till around '95, um, when it disbanded uh here to the surface so, so sources are a little bit murky but it, it seems to to, to disappear in 95 and 95 is also the time when uh, the, the pakistanis did another kind of crackdown they had several crackdowns a big one in 92 and then another one in 95 and i think the services bureau kind of died with that 95 crackdown yeah um we have a, a lot of questions here um how did Azam become involved in the Muslim Brotherhood, um, and can you, and what made him an agitator? Hmm. Um, Azam was recruited to the Brotherhood when he was twelve years old um, by a teacher hmm. uh, in his village. So, uh, and this is not unheard. This was not unheard of because uh, people will know that the, the Muslim Brotherhood had sort of a strat political strategy of kind of Islamizing from below and of encouraging members to take up positions in the education sector. And so you, 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 you all very often found Muslim brothers employed as teachers uh, across the, the region. And, um, and one of Azam's teachers in, in, the, in the village of Asil al uh was a man named Shafiq uh, Abdul Hadi who, who had uh, who was much older? I, I don't. I think he was in his fifties or his sixties. And he had. Um, I think he himself was from the same village, but he had spent time both in Egypt and in Saudi Arabia in the fifties, and he had uh, kind of become involved with the Brotherhood. And and so he and he, he 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 recruited Azam. But Azam was a was a was a kind of a, a kind of a welcome. Uh, Tar target in that, in that he, he, he already was re he already was religious and, and, and interested in um, this sort of general general activity that uh, there are lots of accounts by his family is you know about how kind of bookish he was how he didn't want to come out and play but he wanted to read how he read at night um, and also you know how, how meticulously he kept his prayers it was unusual uh, at that time, uh, one account by his sister says that you know, you know, one sort of activity among the kind of the young boys at the time was to go out and kind of and eat <clears throat> almonds and kind of take, just take almonds from the field. And as long as we didn't want to do that, he, he came out with the other guys, but he didn't want to take the almonds because he considered that theft from the farmer. Um, so, so he, he 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 had this kind of religious inclination from a very early age, um, and I should say that you know this, that's even accounting for the hagiographic tendency of some writers. You know, there's, if you read biographies of clerics, they're always they're often like that. You know, he was a genius, he was so pious, etc. But in this case, we have the sources are so specific and so diverse that I think we can say that's the case. And so he was religious, and so he get, comes into contact with his teacher, and he becomes involved with, you know, sort of typical Muslim Brotherhood sort of activities uh, in the Janin area, area in, um, in the sixties, uh, late fifties and sixties. So he kind of he goes around knocking on doors to do missionary work. He, you know, they organize these sort of, you know, study circles. They have a little. Uh, Kind of uh, office uh, or kind of place in in Janine, uh, where they kind of assemble, um, and also at this time, you know, th this is when Azam also comes into kind of conflict with the leftists. This is another theme of, in the first half of the book that I you know, did mention earlier. But 
Azam hated leftists uh, mm. because uh, he saw he, because he saw them as competitors for the leadership of the Palestinian cause. He wanted to liberate Palestine, but under an Islamic flag, and uh, and uh, for most of his kind of um, life, uh, at least up until the late 70s, you know, the, 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 the leftist Palestinians were in charge and the religious, you know, Muslim Brotherhood Palestinians were a small minority. And he was very bitter about that. And, and so already in the 60s, when he's like a teenager you know, in Janin, Muslim Brother is like, they, they, you know, there are these skirmishes with leftists, you know, at some point leftists kind of raid their little apartment and kind of live and take all, all, all the papers and throw them out in the street, things like that. Later, when he's among the Fidayeen in 1969, 70, uh, he's in a Muslim Brotherhood part of the Fidayeen, like it was a camp um, apart with just Islamists, but they're situated very close to another, to other camps with, 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 with uh, communists, you know, PFL, PFLP types, the most hardline leftist um, Palestinian fighters, you know, and there's basically war, not literally, they don't fire on each other, but they, you know, they, they throw insults at each other and, um, uh, and they, and then kind of speak badly of each other all the time. And, 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 and uh, Azam is very, uh, <laughs> critical of, of them, uh, uh, in his writings in the, in the seventies. So this sort of hatred for the for the of the leftist is something that starts early, and it's and it's, I think it's a perhaps almost a forgotten theme in the kind of the history of political Islam and of the Muslim Brotherhood. The extent to which the Brotherhood saw the leftist as sort of a this kind of fifth column, or this, this is an in, internal threat to the you know prosperity of uh, of their societies. Yeah, one thing that's striking when you read Jihad magazine, and I think this is Azam's influence, is the this kind of mysticism around the martyrs and the, the kind of the perfume of their bodies and the and, and I and I I think from reading your book that this came from Azam and is this a, is this a, is this even a kind of quasi heretical view or what, what how, how would you class that as a sort of uh, in, 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 is it a mainstream view? Um, it's quite complicated, and I, to be perfectly honest, I don't quite understand it myself. But um, what I can say is that um, Azam is the first sort of it's, it's the first uh, militant Islamist to write at length about this mm. uh, in in Arabic. So his book, like the Signs of the Merciful in the Afghan Jihad, and and the articles he wrote in in uh, in, uh, in Islamist magazines shortly before that they are the kind of the first you know you know lengthy writings in that about that theme um, however um, you i mean he wasn't taking this out of thin air and it's not heretical i would say uh, because uh, you know elements of this go way back um I mean, there you know there are talks about kind of miracles and and, and things you know in scripture, um, and and some of these you know generally it's just belief in that you be, you can become a martyr by dying in battle or that you know the, the special things before the martyr all this is fairly mainstream. Uh, if you, I mean if you believe that a person becomes a martyr in the first place, I mean that's another discussion. But um, uh, also. You know, in the, even in the modern um, period, you find references to sort of miracles, or even battlefield miracles, in other places. There are uh, so there's some writings about the the, the, the Indian Pakistan, some some of the Indo-Pakistani wars of the of um, was it, is it 1971 where there are reports of miracles there. And also the Egyptian some Egyptian sources with reference to references to you know, miracles, kind of helping the Egyptian forces in the war with Israel in 1973. But perhaps more importantly, um, uh, the Afghans had a vibrant kind of oral tradition of sort of um, martyrdom miracles and battlefield miracles before Azam came to Afghanistan, and many of the 
the stories that Azam reports in his books are from Afghan Mujahideen. So, um, uh, so for whatever reason, and this is where my kind of knowledge and understanding kind of comes to a limit. I don't know where exactly that kind of Afghan tradition comes from, how old it is, etc. To what extent the Afghan, the, the Mujahideen kind of took it in a different direction in the late 70s or not, that I don't know. But this, the, the short answer is that it's kind of yes and no. I mean, it was what he did was new in the sense that he kind of elevated this theme you know, made it and highlighted it and projected it to audiences that were not, that had not really seen it before. But also, you know, this this was not completely new. This was in the, you know, in the tradition to some extent. Um, I should say that, you know, this theme wasn't just kind of a curiosity or like something, or, oh, look how crazy they are. They, they think, they believe these, these superstitious things. Um, I think it had a, a real, you know, impact on the mobilization in that it um, captured people's attention in a way that another, you know, type of propaganda product would not. So, uh, you know, if you're, you know, so we have to think, you have to remember that Azam was trying to, you know, mobilize interest in Afghanistan at a time in the early 80s when a lot of other things were going on. You know, uh, Iran-Iraq war, uh, things in Lebanon, uh, uprising in Syria, etc. Um, so, uh, you know, getting uh, Arabs to even to pay attention to Afghanistan or, or come there wasn't straightforward. So, <clears throat> and I think that, you know, just writing kind of a regular report, this is what happened, this is what happened on the battlefield last month. Um, uh, we're struggling, please send people and money. You know, probably wouldn't have cut it. Uh, in that sort of in, in that competition for attention, but um, uh, what Azam did was very original, you know, in the in the Islamist movement. And, you know, writing that book, Ayat al Rahman, was you know was was completely new and unexpected. Nobody sort of saw that coming. Oh, this guy has this interesting book about all these incredible things that are happening in Afghanistan. So that captures people's attention, and you know, really, really, very religious people were inclined to believe this, um, and for them. All these stories, they kind of sh it was proof that Afghanistan was special. You know, if all these miracles were happening, it, it, it was because God cared about Afghanistan. It was, uh, and so if God cared about Afghanistan, then we should too. So I think that the, the, this sort of, you know, martyr and miracle theme was quite important in, in mobilizing people. He kind of romanticized the, con the conflict in a way. Yeah, yeah, it, um, romanticized it, but also gave it this kind of almost extraterrestrial dimension. Mm. Uh, uh, this is where, this is this is the place where not only your dreams can come true, but you know things you've never dreamt about even can come true. And also, you know, he highlighted this, you know, the, the martyrdom and and the and the rewards of martyrdom and his publications, you know. We are celebrated marches to a larger extent than previous you know, militant Islamist groups had done. So, you know, this appealed to people's imagination about also coming to heaven. Um, I think often we academics in the West, most of, who, most of whom are, you know, atheists, you know, don't always appreciate the, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, the, the intensity of belief sometimes and, and the, the kind of, the, the, the extent to which, especially kind of conservative religious people, genuinely believe in things like heaven and hell, and how they they think it's kind of almost as real as in you know, a faraway country as, as Australia. It's a place you you, you can go to. It's just that you know the, the the transportation mode is a little bit different, and <laughs> uh, and 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 so to them, you know, Azam's writings kind of visualized and brought out this kind of dream this kind of prospect of actually going to heaven and that's quite a nice project prospect if you believe in it and um you know again you know in, in academic writing we tend to focus on the on sort of the, the material political explanations and so on but you know the, the more i read of, you know, of accounts of, of, of recruits going and about the motivations the, you know the bigger this sort of martyr theme became I, you know, I think i really think that some quite a few of the arab afghans went you know because 
they they hoped that they might come to go to heaven. Um, Do you read? Have you? I mean, is there a kind of interesting point about sort of other religions? And I mean, obviously, there was a variety of motivations for people who went on the Crusades, uh, which was a global movement, uh, which recruited people from all across Europe. Um, but I mean, the religious dimension seems pretty large in this case, in, 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 this, in both the Azam case and in, and in the case of the Crusades. Yeah, I, I think so too. And of course, it's going to, always going to be variation and, and you know, at the individual level. There will be, you know, for the other Afghan Arabs and for other jihadi groups, you know, in, you know, different people go for slightly different reasons and there's never a kind of a single explanation or single motivation involved. But I, I think that many people, uh, for many people, the, the religious dimension was important, and the, this belief that they were actually they were fulfilling a religious a religious religious duty, and that you know, and that if they didn't do that, they might end up in hell, which, uh, or, and 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 if they did it, and you know, whereas lucky, so lucky as to as to fall in combat, they would go go to heaven. I think f quite a few of them. This was a genuine uh, conviction. Um, and then I added to this, you know, the kind of the, the sort of, you know, the, the thrill of adventure that I think, you know, probably drove quite a few of them, I, I, you know, as, as is the case, I think generally with recruitment to militancy, like people um, after the excitement and the thrill and the adventure and also the, kind of the camaraderie, um, uh, kind of doing something really dangerous, really, um, you know, um, subversive. Uh, uh, that nobody else dares to do, you know, that kind of is, feeling is something that some people are after. Well, that, that's a good segue to a question from Kevin, which is, uh, were Azam's ideas um, influential on ISIS as a group or I, individuals in ISIS um, who traveled to join ISIS? Mm, yeah, I think... Um, um, I, I, I don't think Azam's writings were very has been very have been very influential kind of in shaping kind of the uh, official uh, kind of doctrines of, of, of Islamic State of sort of the, the, the or their strategy in the more, in the recent in recent years. Um, uh, but Azam has been important in kind of providing the initial motivation for many foreign fighters, I think, even up to the present day. Uh, so, and we know uh, that many of the people who travel to Syria from the West, for example, in the, you know, in, in 2013, 14, 15, that they had been reading Azam. We know that the Azam's books were on their computers, or we know that they had, you know, physical copies of his books you know, under their bed or, you know, in their suitcase, in, 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 their, in their bags, or even in one case from here in, in Oslo, the case of two Somali teenage sisters, some two Somali Norwegian teenage sisters who went to Syria in 2013. <clears throat> on, on the day that they went, the, the day that they left, they sent an email to their father saying um, that we're leaving for Syria um, to understand why, please read the attachment. And the attachment was The Defense of Muslim Lands by the Azam, a book that he wrote 30 years earlier. So things like that suggest that you know, he, 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 is, he has been inspiring or, or you know, uh, yeah, influencing foreign fighters uh, right up to the present day. And, uh, but, but of course, what happens with many foreign fighters is that once they get to the conflict zone, they get sucked into, um, you know, an, an organization with its own kind of strategy and ambitions. And that's what, that's what happened with, with Islamic State. So, uh, uh, so I think, you know, generally with foreign fighting people, the, the reasons people become foreign fightings are not, are not necessarily the same as the reasons for which the organization is fighting the host mm -hmm. organizations like and those can be different um so azam is it kind of azam is an entry level ideologue to put it that way and he's mm -hmm. uh, he, he he's like he is he, he, he writes things that are for, first of all it's clearly articulated but it also it's 
it's things that are not, you know, they, they don't seem that radical and they aren't really. I mean, what he's saying is that, you know, if there is a crushing, you know, occupation of Muslims somewhere by a non-Muslim power, that you should, you know, help them out of solidarity, you know, go and support them. And this, this, is, this is not, you know, outlandish. This is what foreign fighters from other political contexts have done in the Spanish, uh, in the Spanish Civil War and so on. So it's, you know, it's something that, you know, aligns with people's moral intuitions, almost regardless of their political orientation. Uh, and so it's kind of e easily <laughs> digestible, as it were. And then, but then of course, uh, it's kind of a, step, a stepping stone to more radical interpretations of violence and so on. So that's where Azam fits in. It's, like, it's this sort of entry level um, ideologue. Does Zam have anything to say about uh, Shia, the Shia? He did, um, and he 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 wasn't very uh, hostile to them at all. Um, in fact, um, in the beginning, at, at the time of the Islam of the Iranian Revolution, he was quite enthusiastic, uh, and we know this from the testimony of none other than uh, Rashid Ghanoushi, the the Tunisian. Uh, the kind of the, the, the grand old man of Tunisia and Islamism and, and, the, and, this, and this current speaker of parliament in Tunisia, he was a good friend of Azam's. And he writes that uh, in 19, late 1979, he found himself at a conference in Italy together with Azam. Mm -hmm. And the Iranian revolution had just happened. And, and Ghanoushi says that uh, Azam was ecstatic that uh, he was very hopeful for, about this and he didn't, you know, the, 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 the kind of sectarian issue wasn't, uh, wasn't an issue at all. So, but um, we know then from other sources that, he, that enthusiasm waned and I think he came to see Iran just like any other kind of, you know, regime in the area that, you know, with, you know, operating like a, like a state, you know, with you know, pragmatic, uh, you know, you know compromises and, you know, and some cynical, you know, interest based policy, etc. So he, he, he never had a particular, he never had a strong affections for uh, affection for Iran or Shiites. He just, he just didn't mind. He, you know, he saw them as kind of, you know, some, you know, let them do their own thing and we'll, we'll leave them alone. Um, and this, by the way, uh, is, is true of, of the Arab Afghans in general at the time. And uh, one of the kind of fun facts of the book is that when bin Laden set up al Masada um, in late 1986, he did so with the help of Shiites. It was, it was, um, it was a, a, a Shiite commander under, serving under uh, Sayyaf, uh, who kind of, who was, you know, who sort of controlled that area of Jaji. And he was the one who, sh who showed bin Laden this location. So, and, and also men from his uh, kind of company, basically the Afghan Shiites helped bin Laden build al masada And they were living in al masada in the autumn of 1986, of 86. It was only in 87 when, they, when there wasn't enough space, they wanted to get more Arabs in that the Afghan Shiites were kicked out of the camp. But, as long, but even bin Laden didn't mind, you know, sleeping in a tent next to Afghan Shiites, you know, in his personal project. It's only much later that you get this vicious, bloody, you know, uh, sectarian violence. The early jihadists were not very fussed about this. Chris Blanchard asks um, about his arms relationship with the Saudi government. Um, did he have any boy his views? How did he feel about bin Laden's ambiguous relationship with Saudi intelligence? Um, Azam didn't trust any government. He was he was fundamentally skeptical of of, of governments, and this um, uh, has to do, I think, with his overall view of the world and of history. In, the, in that he, he considered he considered basically that uh, the nation states of the Middle East were all artificial entities imposed by the West uh, and the Zionists. And that you know the ideal, uh, the natural state of the region was a caliphate. The, 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 and, and he was very nostalgic about the fall of the caliphate. 
um, that's by the way one of the reasons he's, he's very popular in Turkey as uh, is. But he, he he was he was he remained very skeptical of of, of, of regimes in the region and um, but as far as regimes went, uh, Saudi Arabia was one of the ones that he could work with. Although he didn't have like very strong affection for the for, for the Saudis, he, he he says he says nice things about the Saudis that you know the Saudis. Are, uh, you know, this is the country one of the countries that has helped the Afghan cause the most that sort of thing. And he, he did, you know, benefit a lot from kind of host, the hospitality of, of, of Saudi. They, they, they let him, you know, preach and fundraise and recruit quite freely in the kingdom. So, he, and he was kind of dependent on that. So, um, but then, um, and uh, at some point, um, uh, He's viewed skeptically by the Saudi uh, intelligence services a little bit because he has, he becomes so popular among Saudi youth that the government you know starts to become skept, skept, skeptical of him in the same way that the Jordan Jordanian government became skeptical of him in the late seventies. Uh, so Azam is able to 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 fill mosques with like two to three thousand people. Uh, when he comes to Saudi to speak in the in the late eighties, um, he he's a rock star, and um, although Azam is not he's not at this time he's not saying anything critical or explicitly about the Saudi government or anything or he's just talking about Afghanistan and a little bit, a bit about Palestine and so on. But uh, the regime, I think, was was concerned, and in the, in eighty nine they start canceling some of his. Some of his talks, um, so, so they kind of they tighten the screw a little bit, and <clears throat> also in the in eighty nine there was uh, a meeting between Azam and then Prince Salman of Saudi Arabia, who is now the king of Saudi Arabia, King Salman. Um, at the time, Prince Salman was sort of it was the prince, you know, the member of the royal family in charge of kind of the Afghan course of kind of you know supporting it and making sure you know the Saudis interests were you know observed and so on and uh, uh, but the problem is that so, so we know that Azam was kind of in contact with the highest echelons of the Saudi government you know in, if you met Prince Prince Salman that's pretty high up but we don't we don't, don't know for sure exactly what happened in that meeting and there are two very di divergent accounts there's one account that says that Azam was called to Prince Salman for a kind of a reprimand uh, be, uh, to face, you know, uh, to respond to rumors that Prince Salman had heard about Azam saying anti-Saudi things. That's one account of what was said in that meeting. Another account is from, from you know, Azam's close family says that, no, that's not true at all. It was a very cordial meeting. Um, uh, Prince Salman just wanted to to meet Azam and talk about Afghanistan. That's it. There was no there was no conflict. But um, uh, it, it, the point is that, that you know he he was he was in he was he was a pretty prominent figure and he was in touch with people quite high, high up in government. I, government, but I I don't think he was steered or controlled by the Saudi government. I don't think no. And and uh, as far as Bin Laden's relationship with the Saudis, which was you know where there was an intelligence connection. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether Azam knew about that and, and or whether he cared. A brilliant book, uh, which uh, you can get online. We have to find out a way to get books virtually signed in the coronavirus <laughs> era. Um, but we want to, all want to thank uh, Thomas for his brilliant presentation. About 150 people uh, listened to the presentation at various points. Uh, I want to thank everybody who joined the call and um, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you so much, Peter.